Hello and welcome back to the Modern Adventurer podcast coming up. I think being in the hills has just inspired me to dream bigger than ever before, just to question all these limits and these doubts that we put on ourselves. And I came home and of course, being a millennial, I went on Google and I just became captivated by the idea of, of climbing the world's highest peak. My next guest is an adventurer and charity ambassador. He has made two attempts to climb Mount Everest and has completed numerous endurance challenges throughout. He is no stranger to adversity. He suffered epilepsy and bullying in early life, but uses this now as motivation to drive himself forward in these outdoor challenges. I am delighted to introduce Alex Stanningforth to the show. Hi John, thanks for having me. Alex, great to have you on the show. You are no stranger to adversity and challenges. And I think it's great that you use these life challenges through your outdoor adventures. Probably the best place to start is with how you got into these adventures. Yeah, so to, I guess, to take you back, it, like most these things, tend to start in childhood. Um, I had a very normal normal start in life, if you can call, call it that way. Uh, my parents gave me a great start. Uh, I was brought up near Chester and I had it. Yeah, I said I had a pretty normal start in life. But when I was about nine years old, everything kind of changed because I had a malform of epilepsy, which was quite a terrifying thing for a young person to go through at such an important age. Now, that itself was only very mild. Fortunately, it was brought under control, uh, but led to lots of different challenges. I was, rel- you know, re- I was relentlessly bullied all the way through school which just shattered my confidence and left me feeling worthless, Uh, suffering with anxiety and panic attacks, you know, where even having a seizure in McDonald's meant that just the smell of fast food could trigger a panic attack for many years. So that made school pretty challenging. And I hated sport at school. You know, I hated PE, very far cry from, from where I am now. And most weirdly of all, I've had a stammer ever since I've been able to speak. I mean, I've never known life without having a stammer which is pretty unusual when I'm now a motivational speaker for a living. Um, but that kind of sums up really my journey is that it's it's all been about overcoming adversity and using physical outdoor challenges to overcome personal challenges, you know, never really settling for base camp, never following the beaten track. And I guess trying to make the biggest difference that I can along the way. Um, so I think finding the outdoors by chance at about 14 years old, uh, is really that that changing that uh, that was the kind of pivot point for me um, that really set me on a different direction in life. And ten years later, uh, I'm very lucky that now I can combine this passion for personal challenge with inspiring others to to overcome theirs. As a speaker, uh, as an author of two books, uh, I'm a brand ambassador for a few charities and organisations, and started a charity last year based on mental health, trying to restore mental health through outdoor experiences. So it's been a very unusual journey. Um, but, you know, from the early challenges, it's, it's important to say that it's not like I've completely risen above them. Um, my stamina is still very much there. I can go and speak to 500 people, at, you know, in a presentation and then not be able to ask for a train ticket on the way home. Oh, I've smashed up phones at home just for the frustration of being unable to say my own name. Mental health has probably been my biggest challenge of all. And I think that's the important message is that we all have those peaks and troughs. The most important thing is just to keep on going. Amazing. And so when did you get the idea for Everest? When did I get the idea was actually about 14 years old, not long after I kind of found this escape of the outdoors. And as always aiming for the big things, I'm not exactly a very strategic, you know, start small, but it really was all inspired by that adversity. And although it wasn't much compared to what some people go through at that age, um, at the time I was invited hill walking in the Lake District with my friend and uh, something I'd never really done before. My parents weren't particularly outdoors minded. My dad was a runner, but besides that, we didn't do anything massive. And on that walk in the Lake District, one May, 2010, 
I just re- remember asking the question to myself, where's Mount Everest? And I think being in the hills has just inspired me to dream bigger than ever before, just to question all these limits and these doubts that we put on ourselves. And I came home and, of course, being a millennial, I went on Google and I just became captivated by the idea of, of climbing the world's highest peak. I found other people like me that had done it. And especially those with kind of a normal background, you know, they didn't have wealthy parents just to pay for the trip because that's often the biggest barrier. They'd managed to find the funds and, and make it possible. And I think knowing other people had done it kind of gives you permission to try. I think at that age, I just kind of committed to myself that one day I was going to climb Everest. And it just seemed to me the ultimate way to really fight back. And I guess I never imagined at that point that actually four years later, I'd be at Everest Base Camp about to make my first attempt. Good. And so you're at um, Mount Everest Base Camp. Uh, what happened? Well, I've got caught up in the two biggest disasters in Everest history in two consecutive years. Um, and yeah, it didn't go to plan. These things rarely do. That's a pretty much the same as life. And we got to base camp um, after three weeks of trekking in. I mean, I was with a team led by uh, the same climb instructor who'd first taught me rock climbing in the lakes. And we, yeah, we, we spent three weeks walking from Luckler. Then a day before we arrived, a huge avalanche in the icefall killed 16 climbing Sherpas. So it all went pear-shaped. We had to pack up and go home, obviously, without stepping a single foot on the mountain. So I think, I guess my immediate re- reaction at 18 and, and, and the kind of naivety was that the harder I worked, the luckier I'd get. And I think that's true in some, some instances, but also sometimes failure is completely inevitable. You know, it doesn't matter how hard you work, the mountain doesn't give a damn and COVID doesn't give a damn about all of our plans. And it's being able to reframe failure and think, okay, what can I learn from this? How can I use this experience to come back stronger? So after a bit of sulking, you know, you take responsibility and then uh, another year of training, another year of fundraising, I went back to Everest in 2015. And this time we were on the same team, same format. And then we were in the Kumbu Icefall, which is just above base camp, moving to camp one for the first time. And the earthquake hit Nepal. So we were in the icefall about 6,000 meters when the ground started shaking. We got hit by a big powder avalanche. We were trapped on the mountain for two days. Base camp down below was pretty much wiped out by a much bigger avalanche triggered by the earthquake. And uh, yeah, it was, um, well, how to describe it really? We were, we were stuck at camp one for two days with after sh- you know aftershocks and avalanches, um, not not knowing that actually we were in the safest place of all, you know, and that we'd lost three of our team down at base camp, along with 21 people in total. So, yeah, I think had we not left base camp that morning, I probably wouldn't be speaking to you now. So that having that experience at 19 kind of puts a lot of things in perspective. So obviously after that, we eventually got helicoptered out of camp one and, uh, yeah, headed back to Camp Kathmandu. Oh, wow, and at such a young age to have that happen, not once, but twice. Um, what was the, what were your initial feelings when you got back to the UK from it? I think the first time round, obviously, was very different. You know, dreams can be replaced, lives can't, you know, and, and you've, you've got to keep that in perspective. Second time round, it was, it was more about the kind of t- trauma, the guilt, that why them, you know, why, why not me? Uh, this shouldn't have happened. You know, base camp is meant to be the safe, safest place. So I guess there was, a, from a mental health perspective, yeah, I think I was really suffering with the trauma for a long time. And um, I just threw myself into fundraising for the victims, uh, doing some more challenges. And I decided if I couldn't climb Everest, I was going to cycle it. So there's um, a challenge known as Everesting, where you cycle up and down a hill to do 29,000 feet within 24 hours uh, to raise money for, for people in Nepal. I wrote my first book, Icefall, which really helped me to kind of put, kind of process it all. Um, and then speaking, you know, kind of fell into motivational speaking, which was never part of the plan, but it's the most rewarding thing in the world. But I think at the time, um, I was just running away from it. I wasn't really dealing with it um, because nobody else can really understand. You know, the only friend that could really understand was those that had been on the trip with me 
who didn't really want to talk about it. And then also a friend who'd been in the army, you know, he'd seen a lot worse. So even today, to be honest, it's still kind of there. You know, you still never forget that moment of thinking, this is it, you know. And by the end of that year, uh, I kind of really hit a low trough, probably the lowest I'd ever been, you know, and just that sense of loss of everything, loss of purpose that we spoke about before. And I think that loss of purpose, you know, is really hard to pick myself up from. Got to the point when running has always kind of kept me doing something, you know, kind of gave me some feeling. But I remember entering a half marathon and, and just bailing halfway around. I just quit, I stopped to watch and just walked home. And that was when I kind of realized I had to accept that, you know, I needed some help. I couldn't manage this on my own. Um, I think it was when all those other things like the fundraising and the writing had kind of gone you know, I had to face up to it. Um, but I think the, the underlying feeling was that I've got to make the biggest difference I can. You know, I, I owe it to the guys and hopefully that I've, I've been able to achieve that. Did you feel that um, the sort of purpose of Everest was to, I don't know how to sort of phrase this, was to sort of show that, uh, I don't know, how how can I say this? The idea of Everest was very much about conquering the demons from a young age. I think so, yeah. I think at a young age, it was about proving myself wrong and proving the bullies wrong. But then actually I realized that that was never going to get me anywhere. It's the same with many goals in life. If we're always chasing that next thing, success, then we're never, then we're never content because we always want the next thing. And... I think I, I kind of realized that I had nothing left to prove anymore because I'd already got to Everest, which was itself was probably the hardest challenge. And I wasn't really being true to myself and therefore we're never going to be happy. And I think the real, the next big pivot point in the journey was actually in 2016 when I went back um, this time trying to climb uh, Cho Yu in Tibet, which is the sixth highest peak in the world. I think that was more to put Everest to bed, but also at the time it was actually for training for making a third attempt at Everest. Um, that was my best chance of getting over 8,000 meters and getting some altitude experience because I don't, you know, I'd only been to six and a half thousand on Burunsi. Um and obviously on Everest we didn't get higher than Camp One. So that trip went a lot better. There was no disasters. I got to seven seven thousand to uh, two hundred meters uh, Camp One, uh, sorry Camp Two, and then it was the altitude that, 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 as always, has always got me. I've always been rubbish at altitude. And I remember that night in the tent at 7,000 meters thinking to myself, you know, why am I really here? What, what difference am I making? On Everest, we saw our tents buried under a foot of rock and ice and snow. You know, and I was thinking, what would I have left behind had I been in that tent? And I think that was when I, I was able to let go of Everest and actually realize that it wasn't just about the top. Um, and I kind of lost the draw. It wasn't about fear. It wasn't, you know, it was just, acceptance I think that's kind of where that sent me to where I am today and where are you in terms of your your sort of challenges today well since that it inspired me to to kind of stay close to home for challenges and adventure I mean I've always loved running that's probably been the only sport I'm marginally good at or built for um, I'm useless in the gym and everything else and I've always enjoyed running at a kind of kind of a competing level you know up to up to probably marathons probably my strongest distance so I'd had to sacrifice all that for Everest because the injury risk and everything else and I just enjoyed that just to keep me ticking over but I was inspired by Elise Downing um, who ran around the coast of the UK the year before and I loved how she kind of carried people on the journey you know people were joining her along the way in various parts of the country and it was just a really good way to raise awareness and to see what we have here in our home soil, um, something that I'd always taken for granted. So I came up with the, the, the idea of a whole new challenge called, called uh, Climb the UK, which was climbing to the highest points of all 100 counties in the UK. And that was a kind of human powered 5,000 mile journey, cycling, walking, running, kayaking uh, in 72 days. And that was all raising money for Young Minds, a mental health charity. And I threw myself into that and it kind of became my new Everest. And I realized then that that was what it was all about. It was about the journey. Um, and that was the hardest thing I'd done. And it was the only thing where I'd ever actually achieved what I'd set out to do. 
so that gave me a really big confidence boost and and from then on I, I spent a year basically um training for a, you know tra- you know training training for a marathon um because I was writing my second book at another peak and didn't really have time to go off for months and months doing a big challenge so I just ran and tried to bring my time down for you know a, a sub free marathon and then uh, since then, I mean, 2019, um, I moved up in the Lake District, so that kind of took up my energy for the year. Just did a lot of fell running, a lot of races. Um, I've done the odd spontaneous thing. I mean, the end of 2017, I tried to cycle from home to uh, Edinburgh in one hit, which from Chester originally was about 310 miles. Um, so I kind of like the sporadic, spontaneous endurance stuff. Um, but in terms of big projects, I, I felt I needed, I was overdue like a big, big challenge. So last year in August, I uh, I ran the National Free Peaks. So we've probably, most of us have probably heard of the National Free Peaks, Ben Nevis, Scarfell, Pike and Snowdon. But normally you would drive between them uh, in 24 hours. And I did that when I was 16. That was probably my biggest challenge at the time before Everest and after Mont Blanc and everything else. Um, and uh, I decided to run the entire distance between them. So 452 miles in uh, nine and a half days. So about 17 marathons. And I was trying to break the fastest time, which I didn't do. Uh, but that was that was my focus for last year. And I think definitely for the next, for, for the foreseeable, ultra running is my thing. Um, I really love, I've always loved endurance and those really long, painful things. Um, but I think that's where I want to focus my energy now is close to home and, and just trying to do things differently. I'm never really interested in in the conventional challenges. And uh, that's been a really rewarding change, really. What was that uh, Three Peaks challenge like? Because you're over nine days. Were you self-supported or were you doing it sort of solo and just sort of relying on, I'd say, sort of credit card touring types? Originally on on the National Three Peaks run, um, I had planned to be self-supported, but I realised that I'd I'd never ran an ultra before. Well, I'd never raced an ultra before. I'd done one forty-six miler in training, um, and then a lot of long runs, but that was it. So that was a bit ambitious, you know. I was, yeah, I was being a bit over ambitious there. So I kind of changed the plan, and I had bits of support. I had friends and cars, and my friend Rich was there for the first three days, and various people at similar stages. There was definitely a lot of challenge when I was on my own, and I had planned and trained to have everything on me in a rucksack, and then sending things ahead. Um, but with the mileage and everything else, it just didn't work. So I did have a kind of various support cars, but it was self-sufficient as much as it as much as it could be. You know, I didn't have like a dedicated vehicle all the way. I was still having to faff around in hotels and B and Bs, picking up my own food, picking up my own supplies. Um, and I think when you're doing sort of nearly fifty miles a day on tarmac, you you kind of really need that. And I wouldn't have got I wouldn't have got there without that for sure. For people listening, um watching mental health is a huge part of what you do and it because it sort of sometimes creeps up on people without them even realizing you know someone who you see on a day-to-day every day looks like they're doing well but behind sort of closed doors or behind uh the sort of exterior deep down there are always issues that sort of creep up on people how does mental health sort of affect you and for people listening you know how can it be spotted well that 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 person that you describe you know that kind of looks like they're okay was was me and still is me um i mean i, I guess it all triggers back from anxiety when i was younger and the panic attacks with epilepsy but in terms of a more kind of diagnosed problem uh, i first had depression when i was about 16 that actually happened when I was injured. I couldn't run. And losing my outlet, my, my escape, suddenly just completely threw me. Combined with a few other things. I think I'd always been very prone to it because being a perfectionist and very high achieving mindset. Um, and I think I'd, I was always very vulnerable to low mood and, and, and low self-worth. Um, and then, as always, running kind of got me back out of it, uh, having challenges, having purpose. And... I think I've, I've had sort of peaks and troughs since then, but it got a bit more cha- cha- uh, challenging the second, you know, the, the second time around I got injured. Um, and again, I was about 16 and 
that was when you know, the eating disorder started. And that made things a whole lot more complicated because I've always loved food. And obviously, as a runner, as an athlete, um, you need a lot of it. Um, but then that became my coping mechanism. That became my only control. And that quickly got out of hand, led to an eating disorder. You know, that was a bulimia uh, and binge eating disorder. And that's kind of been with me ever since. I mean, eight, eight nine years later, um, it, it's never gone away. You just learn to deal with it. You know, I've never seen food in the same way again. And there's, there's definitely a risk for athletes that we need to be more aware of now is this whole culture of earning calories and training. And it's, 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 very, it's, it's quite risky because I fell into that. Now, I was able to recover from that, but ultimately I wasn't really managing it very well. I had episodes where I struggled. Sometimes I was fine. Another bout of depression after Everest when everything went wrong, understandably. Um, and that was when I went for help. You know, I realized that this is something I couldn't manage on my own. And I guess that was when it got so bad that, you know, I needed medication. Um, but I think I, I've always believed in kind of purpose, not pills. And it didn't work for me. You know, before that could really help, I'd been able to almost get myself out of it by finding a new purpose, finding a new challenge. Um, and I'm not saying that it's not for everybody. You know, people have to find what works for them. But uh, what what really inspired the Climb the UK challenge was the fact that it took me longer to get an appointment for my mental health than it did to cycle around the UK. And that kind of highlighted just a lack of support available. You know, I, I was always able to kind of pick myself up through the outdoors. Um, but as for today, I mean, at the end of 2018, after that year of competitive again, training and trying to race and, and knock my times down over marathon, I'd fallen into the trap of, of under eating and over training. Um, and I guess that eating disorder still, it still manifests itself now. You know, I, I still have to be very careful. Um, I got I got injured at the end of that year. Uh, couldn't run again. A few other things were going on. And, and yeah, then I had a really kind of bad year in and out of therapy and things. And and yeah, I mean, I'm very open about it, as you can tell, because I think I've realized that everybody is dealing with something. And if my story helps other people to, to put their hand up first, I know that has a positive multiplier effect. Um, you know, I, I'm in, I think I'm in a really good place now. Um, some, of the, you know, some of the help I've had has been fantastic, and I'm very grateful for that. And I still have to work on that. You know, I'm still my own therapist now. Um, I still have to watch out for the triggers and, and, and take action. Um, but I'm very grateful that I can I can run and stay active and, and now have a much healthier relationship with food. But I think starting the charity has all been about trying to help other people find those tools because uh, people can see me speaking on the stage very confidently and looking fine um, when really they don't know what's going on behind. And uh, one of the guys that inspired me to open up was um, Tom Fairbrother, who set up a project called uh, Train Brave. And I saw that he'd had, he'd had such a positive response to speaking openly that I had nothing to be afraid of, really. I think what I love about your story is how you've used something negative in your life and moved it into such a positive sort of uh, community and um, sort of passion that you have. Hmm. I, I guess that's been my default response from a young age, from that first walk in the lakes, it's like that realization that we don't always get to choose our challenges. We just choose how we respond to them. Um, yeah. And that happens by default now. And, and whether it's on an expedition or just day-to-day -day life, um, just an attitude we have to take. And same with COVID. I mean, I sat down at the start of lockdown and said, okay, what can I do in this time to make a difference? Because uh, I can't control this and I can't control that. Um, but yeah, adversity is the best teacher and it's, it, you know, the, 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 there's the old quote by Bruce Lee, you know, obstacles are opportunity in disguise because if we focus on the problem, we just make it bigger. So with your projects, what are you doing now in lockdown? Well, interesting times. Here we go again. Um, I, I, as I just said before, I think the first time around in lockdown was sunny and sunny and warm and people really appreciated nature. But to give a bit of background on the charity, um, you know, mine of, you know, actually mine of a, the mountains is is basically trying to combine the outdoors and hill walking with coaching. You know, you know sorry to begin. It you know we uh, combine hill walking and coaching and mindfulness and counselling and inspirational speakers. 
into a safe and you know into a safe confidential space for people to walk and talk and not to try and fix but just to build the resilience and the self-help skills that they need and we were doing walks and rambles and residentials obviously um, until the summer we we had to cancel all those because of all the rules so we, we really kind of scratched our heads together as to how we could still help people when so many people have just lost hope they just need needs that support um, so we adapted our programs in the end of last year to work with small group sizes just doing kind of a one-day ramble rather than like a, a weekend event and that worked amazingly well you know we really was able to reach sort of six new areas and a lot of people but then second obviously then the second lockdown came again and we had to cancel our events and we had 40 40 programs planned for this year we've had to have to cancel the first few and we're hoping we can get back to them as soon as possible but what we've been doing as a charity in the meantime is is a, is a lot of virtual things so we have like a, a virtual gathering space where people can come and be a part of an online group guided by a coach just to share their struggles, their joys, and just get some mindfulness. And I've just started our base camp sessions as well. So we're inspi- you know, interviewing, inspiring, you know, outdoors people and adventurers and athletes just to share what, what they've learned from their adventures and uh, combine that with some outdoor skills from our team. So we're kind of inspiring and educating people just to keep them connected whilst we can't get together in our normal events. And as always, you know, we have bursaries so people can can you know, access our work for free if they're having hardship or financial circumstances. Um, so that's taken up a lot of my energy uh, in the charity, but got a great team behind it. And um, my free peaks raised eleven thousand pounds for you know, for us. So hopefully can sustain a lot of our work for the year ahead. Um, and then personally um, speaking uh, has obviously all gone virtual. I've not spoken to a live audience since March last year and that's going to probably last a bit longer. Um, so enjoying the challenge of speaking to companies virtually and, and just grateful to have that. And I guess from an adventure point of view, um, it took me a long time to get back to normal after the three peaks. Turns out it's not a good idea running 50 miles on tarmac. Um, so just easing myself back into running and uh, keeping me sane during lockdown. And uh, we've, we've just started a new virtual challenge called the Lockdown Lap because I think people have lost races, they've lost goals. So I thought, well, what can we do to keep you people motivated to, to get the benefits of being outside, even when it's dark and wet and cold? Um, so this lockdown lap was an idea that people can virtually log their miles and we can try and get around the coast of the UK, which is 11,000 miles. We did that in two weeks with sort of 200 odd people. So we're now going around the world. Um, and then personally, you know, I'm just building up my mileage again for the next challenge in the summer. Oh, amazing. Well, I have to say, I, I'm a big fan and absolutely love what you do. I think it's absolutely amazing and truly inspiring. No worries. Well, there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week. With the first being, on your trips, what's the one item or gadget that you always take on your trips or expeditions? It depends, you know, it can be a, a local run in the hills or it could be uh, an expedition to the Himalayas. But uh, it probably sounds very obvious, but I'd always have my phone because I love music and it it really is kind of the soundtrack to my life. I've always got music playing. When I'm running, when I'm in the hills, having music can just take me to a different place and help me to think and inspire me and motivate me and give me that energy. So as long as I've got access to music on my phone or a player, then that's... That could be my reset if I need to just escape. Okay, very nice. Uh, what is your favourite adventure or travel book? Um, well, I mean, I was very lucky Bear Grylls did endorse my first book, Ice Fall, so I was so chuffed about that. But his book, Mud, Sweat and Tears, came to me at a really important part of the journey because it was, when I, when I mentioned before, when I was in a really low trough, I was injured, I was depressed... I couldn't run. I couldn't well. I couldn't run for nearly a year, and I was told I may never train properly again, let alone train for Everest. Um, and my friend Rich recommended that book, and I'm so grateful because uh, it told about the story about Bear Grylls breaking his back just 18 months before he climbed Everest, Everest at 23. And that book gave me the hope that I needed just to to see the light to keep moving. And uh, and it's also a great book, really engaging. So, sorry, you were off for a year. Was that 
What was that after? That was so that was nearly a year. So that was just after Mont Blanc before Everest. So Everest was twenty fourteen. This was the end of two thousand twelve. So I lost. Oh, so nearly, I, th- I, th- I thought you said you were injured. Yeah, I was injured for nearly a year um, oh, right. before Everest. So you know, I, I I couldn't do any running anyway for quite a while. Um, so that was yeah, that was a big setback. And whilst I had this Everest goal in mind, was that what shin splints or broken ankle or? Interestingly, it 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 was like shin splints, but um, it was actually uh, you know it was a growth spurt. <laughs> so I had this undiagnosed shin pain, and every scan and test in the book you can have, and it was basically a growth spurt causing inflammation. Um, but yeah, it it taught me a lot, and it was a really tough time because I couldn't escape with that. Um, and I've had various you know various injuries since, like most athletes, and just a lot more careful nowadays. All right. uh, why are adventures important to you? I think challenges make the make life worthwhile. I think staying in our comfort zones, doing the same old, just kills our potential. You know, and quite literally, if we'd stayed at base camp on Everest, it probably would have killed us. Um, I think for me, it just makes life rich, worthwhile. We see things in a different light. You realise what's important. The list could go on, really. <laughs> That's very true. Um, what about your favourite quote? I've got lots and lots of them. Um, you can really them. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I can't claim any of my own because I pinch them off off the internet. But um, one of the, the, the most important ones to me, I think, was came to me from one of my one of my inspirations, uh, Becky Bellworthy, who she some climbed Everest when she was twenty, um, a, you know, a few years before me, and she passed on a quote, which is the greatest suffering brings the greatest successes. And I actually wrote it on my wall in big pen in front of my bed. So every, every day I saw, I woke up and saw it. And that was like my motivation for Everest was actually realizing this was worthwhile. Um, and then if I could put, if I could throw in a second one, probably, probably it always seems impossible until it's done by Nelson Mandela. And that was so true. You know, sometimes it feels so impossible, but, and then, <laughs> before you know it you're there um yeah i could go on and on really no they're, they're good quotes very good indeed uh people listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures what's the one thing you would recommend for people wanting to go on an adventure like you well interestingly today i got an advert in the post about um flying to europe this summer which is a bit optimistic considering the current lockdown and but we've got to keep thinking forward haven't we um, because I'm sure all of us are missing travel. I mean, obviously, my adventures have been in the Himalayas, in Nepal, which are quite far flung, they're quite big, and I'm I'm, I'm so lucky to to uh, I've been over there. Um, but I think sometimes it, if the goal's so big, it can be quite daunting. I think you've just got to some, sometimes take those small steps. You know, not necessarily throw yourself in the deep end. So for the short term as well, it might not be bad advice just to stay in the UK, go to a completely different part of the UK or your home country, uh, wherever that could be. And I think you really get an appreciation for for what we have um, here as well. And some places in the UK just blew me away. But I think if that doesn't appeal, you know, if they do want to go on a big grand adventure, then obviously with all the fundraising and everything, there's a lot of things to commit. But I think you've just got to set the date. Until you set a date, put something in the calendar, life gets in the way. Um, and it doesn't become a must, it becomes a want. So I think realistically you know be be realistic you know but then set a date and scare yourself a little bit and just there's a little bit of fear there in terms of being out your comfort zone because that's the most rewarding thing yeah i think one of my favorite quotes was if it scares you and excites you at the same time then it's probably worth doing yeah and if it doesn't scare you it's not big enough um (laughs) But yeah, I think uh, it might be more realistic for the short term to do stuff in the UK, but that's not a bad thing. No, I, th- I think uh, international travel is probably very much out the window for the next six months. Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, looking forward to that. But in the meantime, I'm just very grateful to be in the lakes and uh, have mountains to run up and just put things back in perspective. Yeah, I'm very jealous of where you are at the moment. Um, the lakes is probably... <laughs> the lakes are probably one of the most spectacular places in the UK so 
although I'm very grateful to be down here, uh, I, I have to say the lakes is just stunning. So I'm slightly envious of you up there. I mean, I think I'm, I, I moved here for that reason. Just the hills give me hope and being able to run in the hills while I'm not working. Um, just to have that, that life balance for me is, is kind of what I, need, I needed mentally as well, just to really reset myself. And it's been kind of a therapy as well. Um, after, after Everest, I came up here for a while and just um, spending time in the lakes really helped me to overcome that. And, and just every day, you know, I, it, it never gets boring. Even after the Himalayas, it's, uh, it's magical. Yeah. Well, what are you doing now and how can people follow you and your adventures for the future? Um, at the moment, like everybody else, I'm working at home. Um, so there's still some plans for the summer. You know, I'm just keeping those in mind. Uh, another another uh, attempt at a fastest known time. Um, and then until then, um, the best way to follow me is on social media. Uh, I'm on all the main channels, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn. If anybody has any questions or wants to ask any advice, my inbox is always open. Um, visit my website, alexstanleyforth.com. And then when I come up with some, some more challenges or virtual things, uh, it'd be great to have people involved. Uh, so I'm sure everyone's wondering what, what adventures lie ahead. What's next? Um, nothing confirmed. I've got a few ideas in the pipeline. And, and after the three peaks, um, my body wasn't having anything for a while. And that's, that's perfectly fine. But I think I've got a... I've got a running based record uh, attempt, which is going to be something very different to what I've done before, quite sort of short and sharp. Um, I'm looking into that at the moment. I think it'll be in the UK for, for the next, you know, at least for the next sort of two years, but uh, this one will hopefully be this summer. Um, I'm, I'm definitely back in challenge mode now and looking for the next target, but uh, I've never doubted myself as much as the three peaks. So I'm going to have to really push the bar now and I'm looking forward to that. Absolutely amazing. Well, Alex, I can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. You have a truly remarkable story to tell and really inspiring to many. And um, I just want to say thank you. you know, it's a pleasure, John, and, and it's great to have the chance to, have to share the journey hope, you know, and hopefully give some people you know, a bit of inspiration as well. So thank you for having me. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you got something out of it. And if you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.